A new study has suggested that drinking the Corona beer whilst watching TikTok videos can greatly reduce your chances of contracting the coronavirus. Hello, I'm Paul Barry. Welcome to Media Watch and to the Alice in Wonderland world where reality is whatever you want it to be. Once upon a time, facts were facts and news was news. But now we have alternative facts and fake news. And it's all so bizarre, it merits a special program to make sense of it all. Don't be like that idiot getting caught out on Media Watch. Truly legendary. Corona beer and watching TikTok videos. All right, welcome to this program of objectivity in journalism. Today I'm Christopher Tan, your host. And just before we get started, we're going to do an uh, acknowledgement of country. So we respectfully acknowledge the indigenous elders, custodians, their descendants, and keen to this land, past and present. So today's program, just to run it down quickly. So firstly is journalism, huh? What is objectivity and who cares? What happens if we do not care? And lastly, are we supposed to say whatever we want? <laughs> Who made this program list up? It's making me look silly. I don't even... Anyways, let's just get started. So, coronavirus, epidemic, pandemic, Wuhan virus, the Chinese virus. Because it comes from China. It's not racist at all. It comes from China. I want to be accurate. Kong flu. COVID-19, coronavirus, or simply Mrs. Rona. See, the coronavirus has been prevalent in the media within the last three or so, four months. And now I'm going to be using this example to convoy this presentation or this program about objectivity in journalism. So firstly, what is journalism? Newspaper, media. Radio, TV, news about toilet paper. See, I'm telling you, Mrs. Rona pops up everywhere. I just, I just knew someone was going to say that. See, journalism used to be a very straightforward uh, term in the past, the role of the print and newspapers in the 1700s, and broadcast with talkback radio and introduction of TV in the 1900s. You see, reporters were just simply reporters. They just reported on the facts. Simple. So now we have the internet and everything's changed. Like, what even is news anymore? Digital news, mobile news apps, online radio, podcasts, or is it memes, satire, your friend's endless Snapchat of a concert, or the latest, the latest isolation cure, TikTok? You see, as Andrew Belzi says, journalism is too narrow a term. This is the age of the multifarious media, transnational and interlink. You see, where the internet provides greater profits and greater global influence, he also says that we can't blame technology because the truth is the concept of journalism being constituted to the truth-telling has always remained. It just means that with all this new information and these new digital tools, it becomes more complicated. And for us journalists, there is more of a responsibility. See, um, if you think about it, journalism is sort of like a religion. With the entire COVID-19 situation going around, let's just exaggerate for a bit here and treat the role of journalism as an ongoing war. You see, you make the wrong move in the battlefield and then lives will be lost, let's say if you're the, if you're the captain. And in the same situation, as a journalist, if you send the wrong message about Mrs. Rona to the public, and the next thing you know, everyone's abusing each other over a toilet roll at I was 16 in Woolies. And I think I even heard once where someone got tasered over toilet paper in Australia. It's just, it's just absolutely ridiculous. And speaking of war, if you were the political reporter for your country and the government was concealing facts about why they were going to war from their citizens, would you report that? You see, as Stephen Ward points out, Journalism can be an act of patriotism when journalism's when journalists sorry when journalists hold hands with politicians, they uphold nationalistic values in hope it would better better you know improve the reputation of the country. You see, news in the words of politician defeats the purpose of democratic journalism, which is the civic duty to its citizens to report truthfully and to better society with valuable information. This, 
this example that we're going to show this example that I'm going to show you is when we hold hands with nation leaders. Be sure to vote in our poll tonight. How would you grade President Trump's leadership in the nation's fight against the Wuhan Chinese virus? Superb, great, or very good? And the result? 79% of viewers thought the answer was superb. Unbelievable. See, as Ward argues, us journalists need to unearth and explain the roots of our country's problems. We need to present nothing but the truth to citizens, to have the audacity to question why we would go to war, why we need to go to war. So how exactly do we make good decisions? Let's see, this is going to be a very hard one. How do we make good decisions? I don't know, maybe we use common sense? So what is common sense? Well, in the world of journalism, common sense is objectivity. And you ask me, what is objectivity and why should we care? See, objectivity is about making good decisions, about purely presenting the facts and separating personal bias. However, very often there is a distrust between the public and the media. The dilemma with gaining public trust is often torn between monetizing through clickbait stories or writing to the facts towards the greater good of the public's interests. It should be noted that a journalist is like many other occupations where the individual works hard to retain its job, to act in ways that helps them climb in the corporate ladder. And however, this, you know, this pursuit of the career is often where objectivity gets compromised. Let's just take court cases for example. You see, when there's some sort of controversy involved, one where the information release can help boost audience views, boost profits, and also like social media sharing, but the damage, but that damages the reputation and the victim's safety as well. Then therefore it's not objective. And although it is for the public's interest, it has not been done so fairly or accurately. But if the report is done fairly and more victims that were previously, you know, unknown step forward, then it can be said that it is for the greater good of the public's interests. So as Belzi says, that virtual, virtual in journalism and reporting ethically is better than industrial journalism com conforming to profitability. Journalism is like no other occupation. Journalism is about responsibility and earning the trust of the public. So what are the dangers of not using common sense by being objective? Let's just take a look at this example. A Gold Coast couple stuck on the Diamond Princess cruise ship getting creative to survive the coronavirus quarantine. They've used a drone delivery service to get wine. <laughs> Inventive Aussies stuck on coronavirus cruise ship in Japan get their wine club to bring them two cases of booze delivered by drone. I just want to say that's what makes us proud to be Australian. This is a round of applause genius. for this couple. I think it's ingenious. Good on them. So did anyone actually ask the couple? So it was a joke. Oh, of course it was. How in the hell can we got a drone through the Japanese bloody military? And yeah, think about it. We got it from our cabin, Stuart. We can't believe it. It was a thing we set up on our Facebook, and we stuck every newspaper in the world and every media outlet in the world in. So lesson learned: do the common sense thing and actually ask the couple what happened instead of just control C, control V. Well, let's look at let's look at another example. This news story by ABC Perth is objective enough in terms of warning commuters to allow extra travelling time for that morning amidst the grand opening of Costco. However, was it really necessary to mention keywords like toilet paper and hand sanitizer during a period of time where the people of Perth were panic buying? Secondly, in terms of objective information, the photo included on the right was not necessary to learn about whom were first to line up, the dangers of not being objective allows the community to have a platform to criticize these people in the photo. Famous for... never mind. So what are the repercussions of mass media information on stories about Mrs. Rona? Well, quantity does not mean quality. It means contrasting advices and, you know, polluting news feeds full of the virus situation, as well as emphasis on the lockdown scenario is probably maybe why many people feel helpless Hence, the only thing that they can think that they are controlling is being prepared when stocking up, which is probably explains why the panic buying. So, how do we remain objective as journalists? 
well, on a technical terms, the guidelines are two things, being the fourth estate and the news values and news values. So being the fourth estate means, okay, let's just explain the three estates. So the first estate is the big, big businesses, the organizations and the corporations. And the second estate is the, the politicians and the governments. And the third estate is the everyday people. So the citizens of a country, for example. So the fourth estate is actually the press, the journalists. And their role is to stand outside, outside all of these three estates and to reflect themselves to each other basically means to report on information and facts to these three estates. It has to remain separate from these three estates, hence the fourth. And news values. So if you ever ever wondered how news becomes news and why they are newsworthy, it's because of news values. There's, about, there's four types of world, essentially. So the first world, the second world, third and fourth world. And as you can see evidently, all four worlds have different news values. So for example, in Australia, personality with you know the many bang cousin stories that you see on the news that can be obviously a personality value news value for australia which is why you still see them on the news but in a third con third world country as you can tell personality is not as of impor importance so you probably wouldn't see a celebrity celebrity scandal kind of story in a third world so news values are very important for journalists to follow to ensure that the news is relevant and objective and when you're writing a story or reporting a story let's say about the coronavirus about something that's happened or a, a precaution for some of for for the audience or for the citizens maybe go through this list of news values to ensure that you know you're meeting these news values to remain objective now we'll just take a look a bit about a bit of the stats from the 2018 2019 ACMA stats and just talk about what's at stake so so far we've talked about objectivity online news and you know the importance of caring about having this common sense of objectivity so in this first chart as you can tell radio and print is slowly dying it's not dead yet but it's still obviously relevant but it's slowly dying Whereas you can see television, online news, and social media being the leaders. Now, this is very important, as I said, because reporting is no longer what it used to be traditionally. And online has now overtaken traditional forms. So citizens are, are now getting a cluster of information. And to remain objective it has become increasingly challenging. And the second chart also proves that Australians are now assessing online video content much more. As you can see in total, 83 to 82%, so there is a, it's obviously 1% growth. Uh, but the, the pattern that you should realize here is that the younger demograph obviously will be engaging with this online video, but also surprising to see the older generations still in, uh, also engaging with online video so free press so how do we maintain this common sense that i've been talking about so far about objectivity about objective reporting when there is a free press and you ask what is a free press so as pearson and Polden says every man has an undoubted right to lay what sentiments he pleases before the public to forbid this is to destroy the freedom of the press but if he publishes what is improper, mischievous or illegal, he must take the consequences of his own temerity. What? I don't understand. Because I thought a free press is one where you should be allowed to say whatever you want, like freedom yes. of speech. Now, freedom of speech is very subjective, the terms of freedom of speech. Yes, you can say or do whatever you feel like, but this does not mean you go on a rampage. It means you do so with common sense and objectively and accurately. See, so in Australia, you can say whatever you want as long as it meets the guidelines of media law and ethics. There are self-regulating bodies such as the 
back by as we've been saying ACMA to ensure you do not publish whatever you like. Now a free press looks very different in other countries. What we have a free press of in Australia looks very different in other other countries like I've been saying because of different regulations as well. So it's important to understand this because not, not one size fits all. To really understand why the free press should exist or not, we'll be doing a comparison between Singapore's definition of a free press with Australia's. So the free press of Singapore, as we mentioned earlier about patriotism, Stephen Watt also says many citizens expect the role of journalists to be patriotic reporters when it comes to you know the country coming into conflict. And this form of patriotic journalism is currently seen in Singapore, um, you know, obviously with the coronavirus. Well, let's just look at how information is being passed on in Singapore. Singapore's also got um, a feature of not having a free media. Uh, so this means that uh, in normal times, you'd say there's not a diversity of voices, but uh, in a situation like coronavirus, uh, that has helped the government to control the flow of information. Uh, and so all of the uh, information going out is all effectively government approved. Uh, it's harder for uh, misunderstandings or unhelpful in information that's not conducive to public uh, stability uh, to be propagated in Singapore. Patriotic media, media in Singapore is based around nationalistic values. What I mean is that is that your, for example, your nightly soap operas in Singapore, in Singapore are not just melodrama, humour, or entertainment. The, this, these drama series have deeper meaning and subtle messages to allow citizens to understand and appreciate their nation. Let's just take an example. Let's just take a look at um, one example. In this episode, the producer promotes the scheme MediShield Life. Within the show, when the male character expressed to the nurse that he is a low-income citizen, unable to pay his hospital bills, the nurse proceeds to explain that fees are subsidised by the government for all citizens and permanent residents. This soft power approach has been the discipline of Singapore's media ever since the beginning, so citizens are mostly obedient and trustful in their government. Now what if one let's say, disobeys and damages the reputation of the Singapore government. Well, a 2015 infamous phenomenon named Amos Yee uploaded an 8-minute video on YouTube titled Lee Kuan Yew, who was the first and most significant leader in Singapore. So he said in the title, Lee Kuan Yew is finally dead. Lee Kuan Yew was a horrible person because everyone is scared. Everyone is afraid that if they say something like that, they might get into trouble, which, give Lee Kuan Yew credit, that was primarily the impact of his legacy. Well, pretty ballsy, but Amos Yee's message was rather hateful as well as, as he voiced out a variety of local issues. Now, this was not an example of nation building, but rather rampage, like we said earlier. Well, needless to say, he was obviously, obviously arrested. So, what do you think of a media with a single authoritarian, a single authoritarian voice? Now, we look at the Australia's free press. Evidently, the media is not in any form discouraged to challenge the government as long as it is done so objectively. This is great because any wrongdoings by governments, politicians, will be in the public's interest and it's the journalist's responsibility to report so. However, with this form of free press, it can also contribute to the rise in opinion columnists on breakfast programs and even like their own talk shows based on their experiences. See, their form of journalist, journalistic patriotism can be quite dangerous if there is, if that is the only information people seek for, tune into, or, or are interested in listening to depending on their agenda. If there is extreme patriotism, they would often narrow or often promote prejudice, a prejudice attitude towards nations and cultures. As Stephen Ward terms it as jingoistic reports, this can often portray other regions of the world as a threat. 
see, instead of bridging the gap between the first world and third worlds and the understanding of poverty and other issues, we push them away with racism, discrimination, or stereotyping. Have a look at this example from Bron, Bron Bishop. It is to get rid of non-productive um, Chinese in the Chinese community um, who are non-productive and therefore, in the words of George Bernard Shaw, should be eliminated um, so they don't have to be fed. Whoa. Okay, Boomer. So with Singapore's way of nation building and soft, soft power media approach and Australia's free press and plentiful opinion columnists, how do they do, how do they compare in the exact scenario? Well, here's an example of both of them at a recent parliament address. We have enough food supplies to last us through this period and beyond. You can still shop at the supermarket or wet market and you need not rush to stock up for weeks at a time. Now, on bulk purchasing of supplies, stop hoarding. I can't be more blunt about it. Stop it. It's not sensible. It's not helpful. And I've got to say, it's been one of the most disappointing things I've seen in Australian behaviour in response to this crisis. The question in hand is not about the culture of both nations' governments or the obedience of its citizens. Ultimately, it comes down to how objective its journalism is. As David Robbie warns us about macho media, where a lack of clarity in explaining global problems, such as the coronavirus right now, there is often a lot of noise in perspectives. You see, the public is then forced to understand the mainstream viewpoint. Us journalists need common sense in reporting objectively to produce what Vardy and Garage defines as synthetic statements, information that can be confirmed or verified instead of like meaningless statements that there is no way that that truth can be verified. You see, humans have advanced and we now have plentiful amount of ways and devices to gather information and we will interpret differently from one another because of our complex beings and the desire and the ones to choose what we want to accept as information. Society will continue to advance, so we should listen to what Henry Sigwick you know, says about the principle of prudence, one where we should prefer a future greater to a present. Immediate pleasures should be deferred in favour of greater pleasures to come. I truly do encourage all citizens to watch and read as much as they can, but most importantly understand what those information mean before translating on to the next person. Well, that wraps up the program for today. My name is Christopher Tan. Thank you for watching. And please remember to practice common sense.